See, I'm getting much better at that now. I'm coming in just on time when I hear the right music finishes off. And as it slowly fades away, you get to hear my great voice. Yep, it's me, Anthony Morrissey, the CEO and founder of AMSC. And here I am still in my shed, surrounded by my Chicago Bears and my Ireland 1988 jersey. But you don't really want to be listening to me now. You want to be listening to the guest I'm bringing on. And i got to say, the guest I have today is someone that I've known for quite some time. Delighted to say and see her as a friend. But I remember when I first met her, I met her in Thomond Park, uh, and she had just been involved in a team that bet the All Blacks. Uh, and I remember turning around to my nephew and saying, "There's a there's a superstar of Munster rugby and Irish rugby." And I remember being very impressed with what I saw. And since then, I just watched her journey and her pathway uh, through both Ireland and and Munster rugby, and just to see exactly what she can do. So without just talking away, I might as well just introduce her, Nia Briggs. How you doing? Hi. <laughs> Oh, that was a lovely introduction. It was. It was. I was only thinking about that this morning. I remember my nephew, who was actually on the Clare minor team now, but I remember I brought him, used to bring him to Tolman Park uh, whenever I could. And I remember meeting you uh, in the West End. And I remember you just beating the All Blacks around a couple of months before that. And I remember you were very nice. You shook his hand. I think you took a photograph with him. But uh, it stuck with me uh, how, how amazing that was. Just before I go anywhere else, that game must be one of the top memories you have of playing playing pro sport or playing sport and all was it yeah look I think now that I'm finished definitely I think it's taken me a long time I didn't watch it again until lockdown it was on uh, rugby gold on TG Cahir so I watched it with my family uh, when we were all uh, in COVID lockdown and uh, the the big thing was was that at the time I had been you know just come off a pretty horrific couple of years with injury and I knew I was finished playing so I was a bit down the dumps because I felt I still had a bit to go and a, a bit more to offer and um, and it actually kind of gave me a little bit of a bounce in terms of oh, actually, I used to be good at rugby. I could have, I could play, um, and that was a great team. The best of memories with that group, um, super group of of players, coaches, um, and a really good three weeks. I think losing the semi final to England in that World Cup uh, was just so bitter um, in terms of. Uh, we didn't play well. I didn't play well. I think it took me a long time to get over that, as opposed to the win over New Zealand being the overriding um, memory from that tournament. Um, but yeah, look, I think looking back at it now and uh, and things that we got to achieve as a group was was huge. And yeah, look, it was it was brilliant. Yeah, going right back to the start, um, I always say this to all the guests that I have on: your first memory of sport was it a family member that was into sport? Was it yourself with your friends? What is it about sport that, that you remember the earliest thing you can remember about it? Yeah, look, it was my family for sure. My dad was obsessed with every sport. My mom was uh, was too, to be fair. Um, and then I had two older brothers who were into everything. So my earliest memory was, was look, we're a staunch GAA family. Uh, but my dad played rugby uh, as, when we were real small. And it was probably on the sideline of, of Clanmel, Gall Regions, RFC, those games where um it's absolutely uh piss and rain and uh you're stuck out there in in your overalls and wet jackets and wellies and you're absolutely milling each other on the sideline when there's a game going on but um yeah no it was great small memories i used to from a very early age be really into watching sports more so than my brothers i remember sitting down watching match of the day with my dad watching rugby games um and uh and, and anything else that was kind of on we we were always kind of watching it and I don't know whether it was time with my dad, he used to travel a lot of work or whether it was, um, I genuinely had a really keen interest in sport. But um, yeah, look, I became very obsessive very at a very early age. Um, we moved around a lot when I was a child at my dad's job and um, sport was the best way for me to make friends. And I think um, that was probably a big hold as well. But like small things stick out. I remember we were living in Galway at the time. My dad teaching my brother to kick off a tea in the kitchen. My mother going absolutely nuts. <laughs> um, and then, uh, yeah, stuff like that. You're just like. Um, and then I went to my very. We moved to Limerick when I was uh, about eleven, and we lived here for a year. And I remember going to watch um, Munster play the Neat Swansea Ospreys at the time yes. in the old Thomond Park, and um, that was my first kind of foray into watching. Uh, rugby and uh, I don't know if it was professional at the time, but 
Um, and that was it. I was hooked, really hooked, like made my dad bring me to everything. We would go to AIL games every Saturday. We weren't like my dad would play AIL. My brothers were playing with old present at the time underage. We went to every game and um, it was brilliant. And to be fair, he really grew my love of everything, my love of sport. He traveled the country with us in terms of, you know, when we ended up moving to Abbeyside and outside Dungarvan in Waterford. And I wanted to play rugby and the boys were playing GEA and, um, you know, we, my dad drove us everywhere. And like, I remember Shane being in college in UL and playing football at Waterford and Waterford's not exactly the hotbed of uh, football in, in Ireland. And uh, there was a division four game up in Antrim and my dad drove up to watch it, to bring him back to Limerick to college the, after the game. And, the next day there was a, a write-up in the Independent or the Examiner, I'll never forget it, where it was one Waterford supporter in the crowd. And uh, he kept that up. <laughs> kept it. Uh, definitely would. So, yeah, definitely. They, he definitely, like, my family definitely drew the love for sports. We were all very active. We all played and played our own sports to high levels. So, um, yeah, I think that's probably the mainstay of our, of our family and what happens around the kitchen table our chats about it. I think what I love about that is you didn't once mention a game. So you didn't want to mention a try or a moment. You brought back memories to myself. I remember we when I lived in Cork, in East Cork, I remember breaking the same window with a slitter two days in a row. And I vividly remember... My brother, it was it's the exact same. Yeah. And I remember, my, I remember my father... My father came home from work and I remember the first time he went back crazy. And the second time I remember he just walked out to me, looked at me, looked at the window and just went back into the house. It was like, I, I can't explain it. So I fully, fully get that. And, and I remember watching games with my dad at Five Nations back in the day. And he used to close the cl- curtains and it was just a TV and a blacked out room. And back then Ireland weren't great. And I remember, vividly remember we had Simon Gagan. And I remember all my dad could ever say was just get the ball to Gagan. Just just find a way to get the ball to Simon Gagan. I vividly remember that. I don't remember anything about the wins or the losses. I remember just remember that. Um, when you were growing up then, when when did rugby become you said rugby was a sport while your while your brothers were playing GAA? Was that always the way, or was it because you played so many different sports, I would assume? Did rugby just be the one that you felt you were the best at? Yeah, no, look, I played County Camogie and football for Waterford for um, under 14 all the way up to senior. Lots of um, underage All-Irelands just didn't uh, get one in Crow Park, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I think when I started, when I went to college in Waterford, I um, fell into rugby by accident and um, very quickly became like obsessed with it. I think it was the most natural. I had to work very hard to play county football in Kamogi, to play soccer at a high level, to do these. I always had to work. I felt like I had never really fitted in into those sports. I, I loved them, but, you know, your clubs, GA is so parochial and uh, clubs were, di- counties were dominated by, well, it was in Waterford time in, in the in the women's side that it's dominated by, by big clubs. And at the time I was not playing in a big, big club and, um, and you were always trying to push your way in there. Whereas I felt when I started playing rugby, and um, it became really natural to me. It was it was something that I could could almost uh, fall into really easy without having to understand much. So I started playing rugby in September, and um, uh, I think a couple of months later I played for Munster under twenty ones, and it was my first game. Uh, we played Penn State again in, in Highfield uh, RFC, and it's my first game of fifteen aside rugby. It was for Munster. And wow. um, I, I I knew some of the laws. I didn't know all of them. I didn't know that you had to roll away at the bottom of a rock at the beginning of six penalties. And I remember uh, uh, Kate McCarthy was the, the coach at the time with, and Donald got rest them, just passed away recently. And I remember them saying to me at half time, no. So when you make it, they were literally trying to explain the laws to me as the, as the game was happening. As the game was going on. I was like, oh, okay. Um, but yeah, look, I think... You know, I could kick. It wasn't a big thing at the time in the women's game. I could see space. from, And it was all back to playing GA, nothing else. Mm. Um, and that's why now with my new role, I really encourage players to play as many sports as they can for as long as they can, because I think they all benefit each other in some way. So, um, yeah, look, I think that was kind of it, really. And it took off really, really quickly. Like, you know, play, started playing a year, and then all of a sudden I was playing in Six Nations the following March and uh, got capped against... Italy for the first time and then um, still hadn't played a senior game at Munster, uh, still didn't play senior club, I was playing with John Garvin at the time, they were like 10 aside development and then 
uh, into Clamel and they were really just such the best years for me because I was so raw. I didn't know anybody. I wasn't like, I didn't really, I didn't get overawed by people I was playing with because I just didn't know them and, yeah. um, and stuff like that. So yeah, look, it was great. And um, because my dad was driving me the 45, 50 minutes to training in Clamel from Dungarvan, he, he ended up coaching us and that was brilliant as well for the first couple of years. And we did really well. We had a really good group in Clamel. Kilda Lachlan was playing with Ireland at the time and Gene Lundgren had gone to the 2006 World Cup and come back from Shannon and it was like 2009 and it was just, it was brilliant. It was just the best memories and got a couple of years playing with Clamel before um, I moved into Bowes in UL, yeah. <laughs> And from that perspective, then, like it must have been a bit of a roller coaster from you to starting off where literally you play the game not knowing the rules of the game, which is fantastic, by the way. Um, and second of all, you went from that to getting capped for Ireland. Now, what you said earlier on, you mentioned your father a couple of times in this. There must have been immense pride uh, for you to be able to show to your to your family, but also from your family back, that it was almost like a, a justification for your father having to drive all the way to Antrim to watch his son and watch his son play at a, at a high standard for Waterford, then going up to Dublin, obviously, or wherever the games were played for for the women's team uh, to watch you play for Ireland. What did it? What do you think it meant to your family, uh, your career? Or what have you ever thought about what how important it was for for your family to see you succeed? Yeah, hugely. Like, it was the biggest thing. You know, my dad became really big on the supporter scene. You know, we'd be like him to love an old jolly. Um, and they, <laughs> they used to chant, like, Daddy breaks out of him. He used to thought it was, he thought it was hilarious. Um, and my mom was delighted to get rid of him for a few days, wherever that may be. So they were stopping or Ashburn. It was always a night away. And, um, yeah, so, no, look, it was huge. It was really, really big. And, you know, I've had a lot of ups and downs in this sport and the down, probably the biggest low was that 2017 World Cup and getting ruled out the week before. And as captain, you're thinking a home World Cup and, you know, um, and what this would mean for your family. And to get ruled out from that, that was the biggest thing, not really for myself, but for my, my family, my dad, especially because they'd given so much to you know, to put me where I was. And um, yes, that one, that one definitely hit home, but hundred percent. Look, I've, he doesn't, he won't watch rugby with me anymore, unfortunately, because I point out all the, the laws to him and tell him that the refs aren't actually that bad. So he's given out. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, look, I, I, it is, look, it's the biggest thing. I'm very close to my family. Always have been, they've been my biggest uh, supporters and, and, you know, whether that's to pick me up off the ground or to bring me back down to earth, it's um, it's always been really big. So, um, yeah, look, I, I do know what it means. I know the minute I walk into my house and my parents have a shrine um, to, to a sporting room in our house with pictures of us all playing sports at high levels. Um, uh, girls come in sometimes when I bring them down to for a weekend or whatever and they query if there's any other children living in our house even though I have three other siblings um, so I know I know they're very proud and I know that I continue to make them very proud now I've got into this coaching role but um, yeah look it's, it is what it, like, it, it's great I think in the time you become very innate I was very selfish as a player because I wanted to be the best and my family understood that so I never you know I never made anything I missed so much but I never it never really I never minded because I knew that it was a bigger purpose and they didn't mind either because they knew that it was, I, I was doing something and I wanted to try and elevate myself to be the best in the world. Yeah, and I think that was amazing about that group that you spoke about when you were there. I remember loving it when you won the won the Grand Slam and what made it amazing was it almost felt like you believed that from minute one and that this was just this is what was meant to happen. That's what this group was all about. And what she then created was this legacy amongst amongst girls getting involved in rugby to start looking up to it. And it's a question I'm asked other girls, other women who've been on the show with me, where when they first played, they would have looked at male role models as much as anything else. But you've mentioned a couple of Clonmel. Would that have been your role models growing up as a player? Um, or would you have also looked at the at the male side? And before you answer that, do you now see the, the coaching role that you're in now? Do you see that changing? amongst girls especially not just in soccer with, with the soccer world cup but also in rugby with players that are there do you think there's a, a change since you were involved yeah hugely oh my god huge um and you you know you see it i see it the whole time you know my new job now i'm out on the road watching loads of games and underage training sessions and you know that, that you're a part of the legacy that helped build that and in some weird way because um i think you know in this country we're brilliant to like we're a nation of bandwagoners, aren't we? We just love to jump on anything that's successful and get behind people. And I love it. So we all become experts in certain sports that uh, anybody's doing well in overnight. And 
Um, and that was kind of the same for us. You know, I felt like if we kept winning, we were going to continue to get a big following and, and get more girls playing. And we kind of felt like that we had to, we kind of had to keep doing that because we understood the role that that was playing in order to get, to grow the game within, within Ireland. And um, so it was brilliant. And yeah, look, I think for me growing up, definitely the two girls in Clonmel were a huge influence. I think Fiona Coughlin was another big, huge one for me. Lynn Cantwell, Sarah Jane Belton. Um, these players were, were massive for me, um, not only when I started playing rugby for Ireland, but in and around the club scene for me. And um, But yeah, look, I was obsessed with rugby. I was obsessed with Ronan O'Gara, I think, when he was playing. Um, and, you know, but more than that, I, I always kind of had a, a draw for like the front five, which is weird because I was a back. And But I loved, like, you know, Mick Galway and uh, John Hayes were, were, were huge. And Paul O'Connell, these guys that were were, you know, setting the bar in relation to their performances. And I think, you know, like Anthony Foley was probably one of the best rugby players that ever came out of Munster. His ability to get over the game line constantly while looking like he was actually going to keel over uh, from a fitness element. Yeah, so he was he was just like, I mean, like David Wallace. They were all brilliant players. And I think the biggest thing about it was that they were all they're homegrown monster players for most of them and you want to be able to like they were always the ones like of course you you look across and you think of the Brian O'Driscolls and Johnny Wilkinsons and Lawrence Delalios these guys that have big personalities and were exceptional players but for me it was always the ones close to home that I that I that I loved to watch and um when I moved to Limerick uh I used to literally just sit on the top of the mound in New Ireland and watch Munster play and try and improve and and even try and learn as much as I could even when I was playing so um and that access into it always made you feel really close to Munster and I think that's a a big thing with with the ethos of what Munster Rugby is I suppose. Yeah I remember when I first worked at Munster Rugby Anthony Foley was there and I still remember I was trying to be this you know my accent stands out a little bit even though I was born in Cork so I remember going up to him and going hi I'm Anthony and I remember I still remember he just turned around and goes so am I that was it. That was the end of the conversation. No more conversation. No more interaction. That was it. He went oh, back brilliant. to his food. And I remember, <laughs> I remember, uh, I remember meet, meeting him afterwards. Oh, this is a good three or four years later when he when I'd been there long enough for him to know who I was. And uh, I remember walking, he himself and Jerry Fannery were walking into Tomo Park and Jerry Fannery said something to me about wearing my suit, looking like a confirmation suit. And Anthony Foley just punched me in the stomach. And I remember Jerry Fannery went, yeah, well, he's accepted you now. If he's doing that, then he's accepted you. So absolute legends of, of what Munster Rugby was. And I, I my 11 years there were filled with stories like that and, and people like that. So I really do get it. Now, moving on to your current job and what you're doing and, and the fact of what your goals of, of what that job is, just give us an insight into what your day-to-day running of it and what it is you're actually doing within Munster Rugby. Yeah, so I've a, a couple of bit part uh, things. So I am um, the Munster Senior Women's Head Coach, uh, which I love. Uh, I'd love if it was a... Uh, uh, a semi-professional entity where I get to see these players every day because a uh, 12 week period every year is pretty difficult to try and make as much uh, impacts as you want um, but they're like I love it brilliant group and it's always really really cool to get together with them and but my new job my day-to-day job is, is essentially building an academy in Munster Rugby for girls and a pathway for them to be able to get to green jerseys so at the moment we've just started in May and we've 20 players, 20 really, really good players that um, range from the ages of 15 all the way to 23, 24. Um, And it's just providing them with an elite understanding, a high performance understanding to what it takes to get to that elite stage. And um, so they, you know, we have lots of contacts with them during the week. They train, you know, together. They like an SNC in terms of Lorna Barry now who um and everything is tracked for them nutrition support and physio support and so it's just kind of creating I suppose a mini academy right now for for what it looks like hopefully in three or four years um so that's the big thing you're always out trying to observe and watch players watch clubs see how you can you know help develop the club the, the coaches within the club the players within the club and and how we can continue to grow Munster Rugby. I think the club scene in Munster Rugby has been driven by a lot of really good people on the ground, domestic side, um, for a very long time. But we need to have um, more high-performing uh, clubs within within the province. So two AIL clubs in a 
in a size of a province like Munster with the um the love and the passion for the game is probably not a lot and not a big return. We have a huge amount of underage clubs, incredible amount and and the lads are doing unbelievable work on that side of things. But we need to see that filling out now in the senior teams that can compete across the country. And the more we have that, then the more we can build um, you know, more pathways into Munster senior jerseys and then into Irish jerseys, hopefully. And um so it's a good bit of work to do, um, and it's really, really exciting. But um, the game is going in a re- it's evolving so quickly, it's almost difficult to keep up with it. And um we've got to evolve quicker in order to not get left behind um, from a provincial and national point of view. I think we've done that from a national point of view in terms of contracting uh, players and getting a really good coaching head coach and uh, staff within Dublin. We've got to now try and bring up the rest of the country into that level because uh, as you see the international stage, women's sports changing so quickly, you know, not just from rugby, but you see it too with the soccer and, you know, I can sit down every weekend and turn on a WSL game over in the Women's yep. Premiership and watch Arsenal play at Chelsea last weekend of 50,000 thousand people at the game and live on Sky Sports. It's class. And it's like, no wonder, you know, Mary Earps, the English goalkeeper, selling out jerseys in record time because it's there. And there was a great slogan going around within um, Irish women's sport a few years ago in terms of this 2020 campaign, Can't See, Can't Be. I think that really resonates more for girls than it is does for boys because I think if you're a boy and you want to pay any sort of support, there's a pathway there for you yep. already made. If you're a girl, we're still trying to eke those pathways out. Um, like it's it's amazing. This Saturday, I head down to Carrick and Shore uh, in the Waterford Tip Border to watch an under eighteen game be Ennis. And last week, you know, you're going to Clonakilty to watch Clonakilty play Killarney, and and it's all this kind type of really cool pockets of good clubs and we just got to make sure that we can they can be assisted to build into senior teams so that we can continue to build the game here yeah i think there's two things on that one from the fact i live i've lived in sweden for 18 months now and what i find fascinating about it over here is that when i first came here my father-in-law turned around to me and said come on we go watch a game and I jumped in the car, put in my kid into the car. We got in the car and we drove a couple of miles to the stadium, got into the stadium, paid our ticket price, walked up, got a match program. And only, and only at that point did I realize it was a women's game. At no stage in the whole way up there did I ask, but well, my father never told me. Because in Sweden, they see it as it's a game. It's a sports yeah. game. Whether it's men, women, doesn't matter. Um, and in fact, I would go as far to say is the Women's Soccer World Cup that I watched recently was much more entertaining than the men's just purely because they had to build the ball up from the back. They didn't have this massive physicality that, that the male footballs, footballers would have around just hoofing the ball forward. So they had to work a lot better. And the Irish soccer team has been commercially commercially managed fantastically well with their contract with Sky and with Cadbury's and stuff like that. And that's my second point. The commercialization of women's sport is where everybody's going to be looking now. It really is because they see the opportunities that are there and the more importantly, the trailblazers that are there, like yourself, like other people who are involved in other different sports, are showing commercial companies that there is an avenue to use, uses the wrong word, to connect in with um, sports personalities who are going to give you that exposure that you may not have well looked at before. And the best part, and it's the, I've said it a couple of times in this podcast, when the Irish soccer team was announced for the World Cup, the, the squad, I loved their marketing campaign, which is a little girl kicking a ball against the wall and she named out the teams as if she was one of those girls and she could dream of what it is. No longer was she saying Messi, Ronaldo, any of the male men. She was saying Katie McCabe. She was saying she's going through all the team that was there. And that's how you make success in women's sport. It's not about jumping up and down and saying, we need this, we need that. That will come with this, in my opinion. That will come with this, but it's got to get done right. From your perspective, when you first started playing for Munster or Ireland to what you're now being the head coach of Munster um, and as were involved with the Irish team, would you see that companies are looking at at your players a little bit differently or even more importantly the players that you're connected to are looking at their own value a little bit differently as well yeah hugely so there's a couple of things on that so just to go back there you know what i loved about that soccer announcement for the women's work of the irish team there was a genuine debate on social media about the players that have been included or left out correct genuine correct and i thought wow like normally you know people either a don't know the players <laughs> 
or they just, you know, it's their friends and family that are congratulating them for making the squad because that's usually what happens. But, but it, it's genuine. There was a genuine, well, what about player A? Like, I can't believe she didn't make it over whatever. So I thought that was class. Um, and you're dead right. For the first two or three years I played for Ireland, we didn't have a sponsor. And yeah. um, and we ended up getting Aon coming on board, which were an unbelievable sponsor. They are brilliant. Um, by, if I remember correctly, a director of the company and his wife were going to some dinner dance or something. I don't know what it was. Either we were on television or there was something about us. And she was giving out that there was no sponsor in her jerseys. And she basically made her husband be like... Guilted her husband into it. Yeah. I think, if I remember correctly, it's something along that lines. And they've come on board and they've been fantastic. From a monster point of view, it's really difficult because, as I said, it's a very short window. But this year, for the first year, we had so much commercial uh, responsibilities as a squad that I'd never seen. And I, I, I owed a lot to probably the likes of the commercial department with Monster, to Fiona Murphy, who drives a lot in terms of, you know, the, the communications and stuff, because they ne- always included us in everything. So Marks and Spencer's came on board with Munster this year for the women's team only. Big spread in the Irish Examiner. Um, really cool. Arrived to training every day with snacks and food for the girls. Like brilliant. Like branded a bus for them to go to Leinster to play uh, in, in Donnybrook. They were so excited about it, the players. Little gift packs. Just really cool. Leia, the exact same. Gift packs for everybody. Just stuff like that. It goes a long way. And I remember meeting one of the lads from Leia, one of the, you know, the Munster nights out or whatever, um, in Dublin. And I remember him saying to me, like, is what can we do for you? Like, what you know, we really want to do stuff for you. And I was trying to say to him, like, they get a pack with a foam roller, a bo- water bottle, like bands for them to warm up with, and all of a sudden, like the, the excitement, like, yeah. I was like, that's all it takes. This year, they gave every player free cardiac screening. It's like stuff like that is huge. It doesn't take a huge amount from the company, but all of a sudden the girls are like, like they just feel like a million dollars. And, you know, Access Munster, I don't know if you yeah. actually know what Access Munster is. Yeah. And I don't know if many of your listeners do, but it's like a subscription thing of a behind the scenes within Munster Rugby. And it's class. It's like Drive to Survive, but Munster Rugby, really. <laughs> and yeah. um, it, it's really cool. And I, I had subscribed and paid for it before uh, I, like, before this summer. But they came to me and they were like, look, we want to do a series on the women. And I was like, whoa, like as in, I thought in my head, I was like, oh, are people going to be paying for this? And like, as in, you know, as in, they're going to be paying for a subscription. Like that kind of genuinely thought, I thought that. Like they're going to pay for a subscription now and be disappointed that it's the women's team. And so I went back to the players. I told them that this was the proposal and they were like, as long as can we get the subscription for free, we're in. Like, Love it. Great answer. Brilliant answer, yeah. So, but they loved it. But the lads were telling me from Access Munster is that the content that they were able to release and the interviews and the behind the scenes footage of training and stuff got a really, really good reception. And I yeah. think that the game is growing all the time. And I think stuff like that makes me really excited about where we can go. Stuff that the RFU doing behind the scenes makes me really excited about where we can go. Somebody like Ian Costello in a big role at Munster Rugby, taking such a keen interest into the women's game, driving it from the ground with Colin McMahon, really makes me excited about where the game can go here because I think that it's really important. And when you see sponsors and people of note understanding that the game's evolving, society's evolving, women's sports coming to the fore, is it going to be on parity with the men ever? Maybe. I, I don't know. Do we need to be on parity right now? No. Exactly. Exactly. That, sorry for interrupting you. Sorry for interrupting you. Mm. That's exactly my point. It, it shouldn't. Not that it, not that it shouldn't because it's not value enough, but it's a completely different entity of what you're looking at. For me, yeah. looking at women's sport, it's the game, which is a different game almost. Not It's the same sport, but it's a different style of, of rugby. It's a different style of, of soccer, a different style of, of whatever that may be. And I think from a commercial entity, what is amazing now is originally when I worked at Monster Rugby, the women's sport, the women's team was an add-on. So it's like, oh, you're going to sponsor the men's team. Oh, and also, by the way, just so you know, you also get the women's team as well. Now it's like, okay, you just want to be the women's sponsor. That's completely fine. Here's the co- here's the, the rights connected to it. Here's the corporate connection to it. Here's where we link it in. Here's all these different elements to it and, and using those rights. And you see the same with other sports around. What's even more powerful for me is that women are starting to understand their values. 
I'll give you an example. We brought somebody along to our, when I worked at Munster, to the, to the London dinners, one of the dinners. And I got a phone call from one of the players after the after the event and was saying, yeah, I spoke to this person and they're looking to get me involved with such and such. What do you think that's worth? How much is that worth to me, do you think? What's the value that should be connected to that? In the past, it would have been, oh my God, thank you so much. I got to talk to somebody. This is fantastic. And that's the steps forward for me. And I really think commercially brands are now looking at women's sport and women's players as in the same par as men's players commercially. Not because of what they bring on the, on the TV, but because the dreams that they create amongst girls coming up around. And the most important thing for me is that when my niece, who's nine, is running around the field, she's not thinking of the men's players. She's thinking of the women's players because she can see them and touch them and feel that. And I think that's just sensational for me. Yeah, hugely. And it gives you great hope as well. You know, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not all roses. And, I, I, you know, I'm very aware of the problems within women's sports and within women's rugby in Ireland. I, I, I am. And I'm, but I think the best way that we can continue to try and grow the game is to acknowledge the mistakes that have happened in the past and acknowledge how we can continue to grow and get better. Um, but also by surrounding yourself with like-minded people that want to grow the game for the best that it can be. You know, you'd like to think in the next couple of years, and, and there's no doubt that it will, it's, it's going down that road, whether it's two years or four years, that it's going to be semi-professional and centralised to the provinces as opposed to Dublin. I think there'll be, you know, this Celtic Cup that's happening, um, at the, you know, from January all the way to, to March, um, will be four provinces and they'll be almost playing each other all year round. So, and um, almost like the old, what was it called? The um, interprovincials. What? No, it was Celtic League. The men's. Ah, Celtic League. yes, yes, Remember yes. Remember yes, yes. So yeah, we're at, we're in, we're in the, the process of trying to build that. So last year Ireland had one team. This year they have two teams split east and west, and then you know the plan is in the next three or four years to have a team each, and therefore you're almost semi-professionalizing the game around um, the country, and that's what it needs to be. That's where it needs to go. It needs to have you know, not just 20 players or 30 players up in Dublin, it needs to have something else where you're, you know, I'm not going to say that there's going to be full-time professional in four years' time. I'm like, the resources behind that have to be massive, but there can definitely be a semi-professional entity where the game's getting younger, it's girls that are in college, it's girls that have come through a pathway now. So, for example, I know Leinster, Connacht, Ulster are the same, but in Munster, um, the best under 16s players are already training together in these like, development centers. And like, if they're at 16, imagine what they're going to be like in a program already. What, when they come into me, say at 18, 19, 20, how good they're going to be three years of athletic development under their belts, proper, you know, it's really easy, good coaching. It? Yeah. Like it's, it's all just building into that. And um, so, yeah, look, I, I'm, I'm really excited. That's what, that's probably what keeps me going, Anthony, to be honest. I'm very aware of there's lots of things that need to be fixed. I've always said, though, if we try and fix everything in one go, we'll fix nothing. Okay. And we've got to make sure that we do it from the bottom up so that we have the foundation constantly, as opposed to fixing the elite, which I know we have to do to a certain extent because we've got to compete internationally. But I also think that there's while there's an element to there, and I think the RFU have done that very well, they've not contracted loads and loads of players, they've just contracted a number of players whilst also trying to resource what's coming underneath the provinces are doing really well. So hopefully in time that will marry together and then we then have a very strong, progressive development programme for players that come into a system of 10, 12, 13 years of age. Yeah, and that's again where I'd be talking to commercialization brands and I'd be looking at that exact point and saying, do you want to be in at the start? I remember talking to a small brand way back when I first started working at Munster and they got connected into Conor Murray. And I remember saying to them, I said, you get connected into Conor Murray, you then could be able to be the ones that we created that. And I remember they were doing a marketing campaign a couple of years when Conor was announced as the as the captain of the Lions, I think it was. And I remember they were doing a small little marketing campaign around it. Look, we were here when he was like first around when he had loads of hair and stuff like that. So I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, one other thing Very as well, you mentioned, you mentioned Access Monster. My mother, who was 83, right, has Access Monster, right? And she watched the women's one. And she was like, Jesus, you won Neve Briggs is very, very good. So that's all I got back, right, as a coach. So she didn't oh, so you were she thought you were very good at how you explain things to players. So that's just a little hat tip for you. They they I, edited it out all the 
<laughs> I said that to her as well. Don't worry, I was quick. To, I was quick to point that out to her very quick. I was like, Jesus, that's that was. She knew the camera was there. That's what I said to her. Um, what I'm going to do is the last one I always do to all my guests is like a top ten. So it's a quick fire question, question. And there's nothing in there to catch you out. Don't worry, I'm not going to say anything to you. It's going to yeah. be mad. Also. I can't call it a quick fire anymore because I got given out to because some of the questions people have to think about. So again, take yeah. your time. Don't expect that into it. Right. Are you ready? Okay. Yeah. Tea, tea or coffee? Coffee. Netflix or the cinema? Ooh, cinema. What's the last thing you saw in the cinema? Oh my God. I don't know. Yeah. If you're in consolation, every single person that said cinema has said Barbie. That's literally the whole. Yeah, that, that, no, Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer. That, I that was the other one. It was either Barbie or yeah. Oppenheimer. So that's that's yeah, pretty yeah. cool. Um, when it comes to the cinema, do you eat penny sweets or do you eat popcorn or do you have anything or nothing of moat? Nothing. Oh. Uh, there, burger it has and to be a treat. A treat to get the popcorn. That's it. Good stuff. Burger and burger and chips or a Sunday roast. Oh, Sunday roast. Um, best stadium you've played in or been at. Uh, can I can I give you two? What? That are Twickenham or or the one in Poe twenty twelve oh. after a, a very tough twenty four hour train journey <laughs> and uh turn up to twenty thousand people in the stadium. Uh wow that was the overnight train where we missed the connecting flight. So um yeah, played an unbelievable game, lost by two points. Oh. After he's having had a try this allowed wrongly on video. Not that you're bitter or like that. Not that that sticks in your no brain. Everyone. Back in those days, so. I don't think there was. You, you sound like what was the winger from John? What was the winger from Munster back in the day, John, against Stad Francais? I can't remember his second name. Scored a try in the corner and if he had a John TMO. Yeah. John O'Neill keeps on talking about a yeah. TMO. Um the best moment involving as a player you playing, whether that's for Munster, whether that's for Ireland, whether it's a Clonmel, whether that's for under 20s. What's your favourite moment? When I say that to you, what's the one moment that comes to your mind? Probably the Grand, grand Sam. Great answer. Uh, hardest opponent you ever had? England. Emily Scarris. Um, yeah, what, a, what, what a player she was, by the way. Uh, what a broke player her she was. Her head so many times. Oh, freak. Um, in Sweden, we would think called a fika. And a fika is when you all get around around three o'clock and you get coffee and cake. And it's like it's like a, a lovely cake. It's really, really nice, right? So it's a lovely thing with your friends and family. And everyone takes 20 minutes out of their day and has a fika. So, a fika or go to the pub? Oh, fika. I like the sound of that. Love it. Um, Favourite Christmas present you've ever got? Oof. Got a pair of Adidas Predators, right? Back in, let's say, 2010 or 11, they were the real ones, uh, the rugby ones. They were blue and black. Yeah. I still have them shiny in my box, uh, in the box, in the in the, their class. Yeah, definitely the Adidas Predators for me, 100%. That or Brilliant. my black BMX bike when I was about six. Oh, I, remember, you reminded, I remember there was a bike a lizard bike that I was desperate to get and unfortunately I didn't get it and it was a green lizard bike and my father got a version of a green bike that wasn't a lizard bike and I still it still sticks in my brain from like 8 it's years funny, old I wanted a tractor right for every year from about 3 <laughs> until I was about 7 and I was the first granddaughter so I was the first daughter first granddaughter and my mother was obsessed with dressing me in dresses and dolls and stuff Barbies and I never got the tractor because she couldn't give in to the fact that I was a tomboy. That's not that I'm like I thought I'm not fine about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're noticing so much more. It's gonna be all out. Um, last one, last one for you. Um, I've said this to people: the definition of sport for Neve Briggs. What would be the, what it means to you, and what it is part of your life? You've said earlier on about it being a connection to your father and a connection to your family. But if you could define it in in a sentence or two, what would it mean to you? It it it's the two of the best things that you can get: friendship and competition. And I think uh, you can create the best of friends from playing sport at any level. But you also have the competition element, which I was obsessed with. I wanted to win. I wanted to be the best. Um and yeah, I think they were huge. I think it was just yeah, I think friendship and competition, I think that's a really good question actually. On um, it's a friendship competition. 
that's no, that's that's as good as answer I've got. Uh, I've got some. Yeah, interesting I think that's answers. what it is. I've got some interesting answers from people about their family and the links into themselves and what it means for them as people, and and it's just something that that for me, sport is my life it's 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 where i realized at an early age that i wasn't going to become a professional soccer player um, and i realized early that i wanted to work in sport and i got yeah. very lucky with the lake air Fitzgerald to give me an opportunity to work at once to rugby and i still remember the first day working there and i remember walking into into the boxes is where they left me there until someone came and collected me and i remember ringing my mother because you could see toma park pitch i remember ringing my mother and i was crying I was like bawling my eyes, like going, I can't believe I work for Munster. And then I had to get all professional all straight away when when Enda Lynch, my boss at the time, walked in the door to say hello to me. So I do remember that the passion for me that connects to it and the, the love that you have to have. And it's something that I, I really, really do define is that it allows people to do something they don't need to get paid for. I remember Johan Van Gran, who was one of my interviewers, said that. He said he's never worked a day in his life. And I think that's the that's the yeah. beautiful part of sport. That's, that's me, me now. Go for, for sure. Like I, that's me now. I think I I didn't, I was, I always had a lot of like self-esteem issues. I was always very self-critical. I always, you know, whereas sport gave me an out for that. Sport helped me build confidence in myself. It helped me become, it's probably shaped me to be the person I am today. And I think that that's, that's the beauty of it, I think. And um, yeah, it's given me so many opportunities and you're dead right you know, I've come into this full-time role now and I feel like I haven't worked a day since May. It also helps that you're very talented. I think that's very important to say that. You're very talented, so don't take that away from me. Nia Briggs, thank you so, so much for jumping on the call. It's been brilliant talking to you, as I knew it would be. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks a million, and thanks for having me on. Great to catch up again, Ed. Miss you in Munster. (laughs) <laughs> I love the last bit I love the last bit because uh, normally when I talk to most of the Ruby people they say the complete opposite Um, brilliant if you didn't enjoy that interview I don't know why you're watching my show that's exactly what you want you have somebody who's unbelievably knowledgeable unbelievably passionate about what they're talking about but also have a real desire to make things better and if you're a commercial brand looking at this and you're going well okay we can see where women's sport is going we've seen the development of it we've heard all about it you can now see where the actual pathways are and if you're a brand, you want to get in there at the start. Um, she mentioned very much the Aon example, and that, that's a perfect example for me because that was an example done where there was a little bit of pressure coming, not from where you would think, but coming from, let's say, a family member. And I've heard that story before myself. But now that's a completely different conversation. Now you've got people like Mark and Spencer's at Munster who are seeing the opportunities and the value of what it will be, not just for this generation, but going forward to the next ones. And, and Neve was one of the trailblazers in rugby. Um, and she's now one of the one of the driving forces behind Munster Rugby and its development into Irish rugby. It's really a simple example to look at, but it's definitely something that we should start thinking about from a commercialization perspective. So take your brand hat off and start looking at it. When I'm talking to comp- when I'm talking to clubs, if they've got a, a women's team, why haven't they got a women's team? And if they do have a women's team, how can I get involved and how can I link commercially to that to generate as much money from my brand, but also as much value to it? One other little point, she mentioned it at some stage. It's not just about what you gain, it's also the CSR project. I love the fact that Leia and MS both gave the players something. And listen to what she said about the reaction the players have. I guarantee you some of those players will now be going into M&S and buying their products with M&S. I'll be going changing their insurance to Leia because they feel a loyalty to that. That's what you want to have. That's the connection into the brand. Anyway. Again, no one really wants to listen to me sometimes. Uh, thank you so, so much for joining. Uh, all the information is down the bottom. We've got loads of different podcasts come up uh, between now and the end of the year. As I said, I'm into season two. I'll be hitting season three very quickly. But again, as always, it's been brilliant to listen to you all. Uh, I listen to you all. What am I saying? It's been brilliant to talk to Neve. You'll hear my music coming in to kick me out. As always, look after yourselves. Enjoy. Thanks very much. <laughs>